Hi, reader. I'm Cindy Burnett. Welcome to my award-winning podcast, Thoughts from a Page, which is a member of the Evergreen Podcasts Network. On the show, I chat with authors whose books I have enjoyed about their new releases, and I give you a peek behind the curtain of the publishing industry with my Behind the Scenes series. With so many books coming out weekly, it can be hard to decide what to read, so I find the best ones and share them with you. If you're looking for a community of readers, bonus content, and a chance to read books before they hit the shelves, I hope you'll consider joining my Patreon group, which is filled with a wonderful bunch of book lovers. The link to join is in the show notes. Do you love to be in the know about upcoming books? Kelly Hooker of At Kelly Hook Reads Books and I do too. We couldn't find a comprehensive list of titles all in one place, so we made one ourselves, and now we're sharing it with you. Our literary lookbook is a list of 182 books releasing from January to May 2024, curated for our communities. The link to buy it is in my show notes. Today, Kelly Hooker returns to chat with me about our favorite debut novels. Kelly is an avid reader, reviewer, and bookstagrammer. She works very part-time as a speech pathologist in Michigan and has three toddler boys. As a result, she firmly believes that nap time is for novels. She is an audiobook enthusiast and loves hosting her signature chapters and chats. She creates seasonal reading guides to help readers pick up the right book at the right time. I hope you enjoy our conversation. And now for a quick break. For the last year, I have been focusing more on my health and eating habits. In connection with that, I have started drinking AG1 in the morning. When I started drinking AG1 daily, I could feel a real difference in my health and energy levels. That is because AG1 is a foundational nutrition supplement that supports your body's universal needs like gut optimization, stress management, and immune support. Since 2010, AG1 has led the future of foundational nutrition, continuously refining their formula to create a smarter, better way to elevate your baseline health. I recommend AG1 to all of my family and friends because the company has a team of doctors and scientists. It is tested for 950 contaminants and is NSF certified for sport. It is formulated based on the latest science and it maintains high quality standards. Thanks AG1 for sponsoring my show. AG1 is a supplement I trust to provide the support my body needs daily. If you want to take ownership of your health, it starts with AG1. Try AG1 and get a free one-year supply of vitamin D3K2 and five free AG1 travel packs with your first purchase. Go to drinkag1.com slash thoughts from a page. That's drinkag, the number one, dot com slash thoughts from a page. Check it out. And now back to my show. Welcome, Kelly. How are you? I'm doing well, Cindy. How are you? I'm doing well as well. And I'm excited because this time of year with fewer books coming out, we get to do more of these type of episodes where we get to chat about some of our favorite books. Yeah, I think it was really fun to kind of look back over the years and find some books that I haven't thought about but have really loved over the years. So today's topic is debut novels, and we are talking debut novels of novelists that have not had a second book come out yet. So we had a wonderful time, though, going back and looking and determining which were debut novels and what we wanted to include. Yeah, it was great to look back. And again, some tried and true favorites that I can't wait to recommend. And the parameters we gave were it didn't matter if an author had had nonfiction out because we're just talking about debut novelists. And then they don't have a second book out yet and a second book out in the U.S. because one of mine would not have made it if U.K. books counted. But since we said just second books coming out in the U.S., we were good to go. Yes. We also wanted to mention that we excluded some new release books that we really loved because we will be talking about these for our end of the year episode. So we wanted to feature some other books too. I'm so glad that you mentioned that because that was on my list. I had probably three or four that were debuts from this year that are going to make my best of. And so I didn't want to have the same books being chatted about within weeks of each other and you had the same issue. So yes, we, we pulled those off our list. Yeah, there's enough good debuts to go around. <laughs> exactly. Well, what else has been going on with you? Anything exciting? We are looking forward to our upcoming Chapters and Chats event with Rhea Fry, the author of The Other Gear, coming up the first week of December. So if you want to join for that one, feel free to message me, but we can't wait to chat with Rhea. What's new with you? Not too much. We just sent out our Evite for our December salon where Valerie Kaler, the owner of Blue Willow, comes and recommends her favorite reads that will make great gifts. And then we have three vendors that come as well. So I'm really looking forward to that. That will be a fun one. Oh, that sounds fun. That's perfect for the upcoming holidays. I think people are always looking for great bookish gifts to give. Absolutely. And I'm so excited. So hopefully this is becoming a trend 
because another one of my very good friends, my best friend actually, who I went to law school with and lived with her all three years is coming in for that one. So she's coming to stay with me. Oh, that will be so much fun. I need to start having guests for every salon. Yes, you do. I was like, I've been there. That's great. (laughs) Exactly. You set a trend. (laughs) Perfect. Well, would you like to start with your first book? And I will say our books are in no order. We just happen to pull them all together. We're each recommending 10 titles. And then we're going to recommend a couple 2024 at the end. But they're just in the order that we put them down on the paper. I'll start us off with Lucky Girl by Irene Muchimi and Deertru. This is an own voice debut, and it follows Soila, who is a young Kenyan woman seeking to define womanhood, faith, and relationships on her own terms. Soila leaves Kenya to pursue university in New York City. She starts off, she's really ambitious, and she's a bit headstrong. And we follow Soila as she learns to navigate life in a new country. And she really is wrestling with familial obligations and is trying to discover what it means to forge her own path despite her mother's wishes. They, they kind of clash throughout the whole book. I love this coming of young adult age story and the cross-cultural issues that the story explored. And that was Lucky Girl by Irene Muchimi and Dietru. I really liked that one as well. You put that one on my radar. You had it on your summer reading guide and I was not even familiar with it. And I picked it up, loved it, ended up recommending it on Houston Life and then interviewed her for the podcast. But that's a great choice. Yeah, I thought it was wonderful. I can't wait to see what she does next. What's your first debut? So my first debut is Banyan Moon by Tao Tai. Banyan Moon follows the lives of three generations of Vietnamese women. When Min passes away, she leaves Wong and Anne Banyan House, the gothic and mysterious home where Min raised Anne. However, Wong and Anne are estranged and cannot fathom owning a home together. As the story bounces around between Min's early years in Vietnam and the present as Anne and Wong get to know each other again, Long buried secrets are revealed. With Min looking out for her daughter and granddaughter from the great beyond, the women begin to understand each other better and come to terms with their choices and how those choices impacted their relationship with each other as well as with others. My Patreon group read this one early as an early read pick, and we met with Tao before it was announced as a read with Jenna pick. I knew it was a read with Jenna pick, but I knew she couldn't talk about it, so I couldn't bring it up. But I was very, very excited that it had been selected as a read with Jenna pick because I think it's a delightful book. I think so, too. And one of my favorite covers of the year. It is really pretty. And that is Banyan Moon by Tao Tai. Next for me is A Place for Us by Fatima Farheen Mirza. This came out in 2018, and it was the first character-driven novel that I loved. Before reading this book, I only thought that I was a plot-driven type of gal. But I loved this story so much. I actually had to just look up the synopsis because the details of the story were escaping me. But I will never forget how this book made me feel because it was so emotionally resonant. So this is a family drama that follows an Indian American Muslim family. And we meet the parents and then their three older children at a wedding. That's where the story opens. And then their estranged son is attending. And it's a big deal. The layers are slowly peeled back. And then we see how the family became so fractured. I loved the cross-cultural elements and the cultural tension between the parents and then their children and those generational differences as the children grew up in the United States. This was just such a great book, and I hope that more people pick it up. And that was A Place for Us by Fatima Farheen Mirza. I remember when that came out and people were raving about it, but I never read it. I think that you would really, really like it. And I believe there's two daughters and a younger son. So it's the same family structure as you have. Oh, exactly. Okay, I definitely need to add it to my list. Yes. So my next one is The Golden Spoon by Jessa Maxwell. The creative concept of this book drew me right in. A dead body is found during the filming of a highly rated baking show at Grafton, a historical mansion in rural Vermont, and the main host childhood home. For the 10th season of Bake Week, Host Betsy Martin is less than thrilled to be sharing the spotlight with cutting board host Archie Morris while filming the episodes at her home. When small things start going awry on day one, like salt replacing sugar in a canister, no one thinks twice about it. But when a dead body is found, the contestants realize that something more sinister is at play. Told from the points of view of the various contestants and Betsy, The Golden Spoon is a delightful mystery set in the world of baking competitions with an Agatha Christie vibe. The book is already being made into a limited series on Hulu and will lend itself so well to the screen. I am sure the writer's strike and the actor's strike have slowed that process down, but I cannot wait until it eventually makes its way to the screen. 
Her second book shows up on Goodreads with a pub date of August 2024 and is entitled, I Need You to Read This, and I'm really looking forward to that. And this one is The Golden Spoon by Jessa Maxwell. With a title like, I Need You to Read This, I mean, how can you not? (laughs) Exactly. I was like, ooh, that's a good one. Okay, I will. Yeah, say no more. The next book for me is How to Be Remembered by Michael Thompson. How to Be Remembered is a really delightful coming-of-age story that follows Tommy Llewellyn, who is destined to be forgotten by the universe each year on his birthday. We meet Tommy as an infant and follow him into adulthood as he navigates a world where everyone he meets is just bound to forget his very existence, despite his own memories remaining intact. I adored Tommy as he fought to carve out a place for himself in the world. This story had such a rich cast of characters, and I loved the themes of identity and legacy. If you love the found family trope and a big-hearted story, be sure to pick up How to Be Remembered by Australian debut author Michael Thompson. And that came out in June of this year, and I feel like it's one of my under-the-radar gems for the year. It is just such a delight. I was just going to ask you if that had come out earlier this year. I think I vaguely remember when it came out, but I didn't read it. So it sounds like another to add to my list. Yeah, it's really sweet. What's next for you? So the next for me is The Keeper of Stories by Sally Page. When Janice starts cleaning for Mrs. B, a shrewd and tricksy woman in her 90s, she meets someone who wants to hear her story. But Janice is clear. She is the keeper of stories. She doesn't have her own story to tell. At least not one she can share. But Mrs. B is no fool and knows there is more to Janice than meets the eye. This book includes so many themes that I enjoy. Intergenerational relationships, the importance of community, found families, how stories can change our lives, humor, and more. Janice cleans home for a living and collects her clients' stories as she works. She doesn't believe she deserves her own story, as I mentioned above, but as the book progresses, she slowly understands that everyone has a story. And there's the best dog ever in this book. He's a true standout. Sally's second book came out in the UK, but has not come out here in the US, so I consider that she meets our requirements. And that is The Keeper of Stories by Sally Page. I love the idea that everybody has their own story because I think that is so true and a good reminder. I agree. Okay, next for me is Night Crawling by Layla Motley. Night Crawling is an absolutely stunning debut, and it's based on a true story of a police sex scandal within the Oakland Police Department. We follow high school dropout Kiera as her young life unfolds in raw and very, very challenging ways. I'm just blown away that Layla Motley wrote this story when she was only 17 years old. She was the Youth Poet Laureate of Oakland, and that absolutely comes across with her lyrical prose. Motley explores privilege, consent, and the choices that people make when their back is against the wall. The story is dark, yet illuminating, heartbreaking, yet hopeful. And that was Night Crawling by Layla Motley. I will say, I remember when that one came out, and I think it is too dark for me, but so many people read it and loved it. Yes, I just checked her website and Instagram to see if she had anything new coming up, and not that I could find, but hopefully soon. It's fun to investigate. It is. I did a lot of investigating this episode. I did too. Wanted to make sure my books were still debuts. (laughs) I was like, I think they are, but I need to make sure. (laughs) So my next one is The Local by Joey Hartstone. When author Joey Hartstone learned that the small East Texas town of Marshall is improbably one of the most popular places in the United States to argue patent cases, he knew he needed to set a legal thriller there. The local follows attorney James Euchre, who serves as local counsel to the patent attorneys who file hundreds of cases a year in Marshall. When Amir Zawar, one of his patent clients, ends up charged with the murder of the local judge, the client demands that Euchre defend him with the help of a former prosecutor. He agrees to defend Zawar and gets dragged into the world of criminal defense. This unique and fast-paced legal thriller kept me on the edge of my seat. I particularly love the patent law aspects of the story. I had no idea that Marshall, Texas was such a hotbed of patent law and love learning about that and how it impacts both the town and the surrounding area. I do understand since this book came out that there have been some regulations or some kind of push to pull some of those cases from Marshall, Texas, change the way things are done but I'll be curious to see how that unfolds. And I looked because I thought this was a beginning of a series to see if Joey Hartstone had anything coming up, but I couldn't find anything yet. And that is The Local by Joey Hartstone. Oh, that's interesting that there may be some legal updates coming. Huh. I know. I thought so too. Okay, next for me is Last Summer on State Street by Toya Wolf. This was one that we both loved and could have gone on either of our lists. 
This is another coming of age story. I realize that my list is filled with them. And so those must just be the ones that stick with me. This story follows Fifi Stevens in the summer of 1999. The high-rise building she calls home is slated to be demolished by the Chicago Housing Authority, and this is based on the housing project that Toya Wolf grew up in. Fifi reckons with the heartbreaking realities and friendships lost during that formative summer in her adolescence. I really appreciated the themes of forgiveness, family bonds, and the importance of home. This is such a short story, but it has so much depth and heart. And that was Last Summer on State Street by Toya Wolf. I laugh because we both loved this book and debated who was going to get to talk about it. When Mary and Pamela come on my show with their most anticipated reads, we always have these hilarious email strings because they will be just quickly sending out whichever titles they want and calling them and going back and forth. And they laugh that they arm wrestle over the titles. And I thought that could have been this one for us because we both loved it so much. You got to be feisty. You got to be fast. Yeah. (laughs) But that is a great one. So my next book is Dirt Creek by Haley Scrivener. Dirt Creek is a slow burn mystery about the murder of a 12-year-old girl in a small town in rural Australia and the repercussions on the community, its families, and the children living there. The story is told using multiple points of view, punctuated by a Greek chorus giving voice to the town's remaining children. Durton, nicknamed Dirt Creek, is a small town whose residents are hiding numerous secrets. When 12-year-old Esther doesn't return home after school, Durton's residents are sent into a tailspin, obsessing about how such a thing could happen in their small town. When the police arrive and begin working the case by organizing searches with local volunteers and interviewing everyone in the town, it quickly becomes clear that everything is not as it seems. Scrivener weaves an engrossing tale of being in the wrong place at the wrong time and how the choices we make have long-lasting consequences. I particularly loved the Greek chorus aspects of this with the remaining children being given their voice and being able to communicate to the reader, tell the reader certain things. I just thought it was beautifully done, certainly has a very strong sense of place. And that is Dirt Creek by Haley Scrivener. Yes, I really enjoyed that one too. Yes, very well done. I have another slow burn suspense debut and it's Shadows of Pecan Hollow by Caroline Frost. This story follows shifty smooth talker Manny Romero as he crosses paths with Kit Walker, a foster child 20 years his junior. At only 13 years old, Kit is enamored with Manny's attention and growing affections, despite his criminal lifestyle and increasingly exploitative behavior. So we meet the duo in the 1970s at the height of their criminal activities, and then we follow them 20 years later when Manny is released from prison and he is seeking to reconnect with Kit. The story is dark and deeply unsettling, and yet I could not put it down. I loved the themes of loyalty, community, and the search for belonging. And that was Shadows of Pecan Hollow by Caroline Frost. I actually just started her next book, The Last Verse, which comes out in March 2024. I was just going to ask you if you had picked it up yet. Yeah, I just started it on my Kindle yesterday. Good. I can't wait to hear how it is because it sounds really good. Yes. So my next book is Winter Counts by David Heska Wombly Wyden. Winter Counts is supposed to be the first book in a new series starring Virgil Wounded Horse, a vigilante enforcer on the Rosebud Indian Reservation in South Dakota. He is hired by those seeking justice when the American legal system or tribal council fails them. Heroin has turned up on the reservation, and its presence has personally impacted Virgil. Enlisted by his ex-girlfriend's father to find the heroin dealers, Virgil heads to Denver to find the heroin source and to piece together how seemingly unrelated events are connected. Wyden's stellar writing and absorbing mystery are accompanied by a look at life on a reservation today. As an enrolled member of the Sikangu Lakota Nation, I think I pronounced that right, the tribe that lives on the Rosebud Indian Reservation, Wyden credibly details what life is like on the reservation, the broken criminal justice system, what it means to be a Native American in our century, and the challenges faced by those trying to preserve their own cultural identity. This book received so many accolades, and there was supposed to be a sequel coming the following year, but we have long passed that deadline, and I'm not sure what's going on. I tried to follow up with the publisher, but they didn't respond, and I tried to look on Goodreads to see if there was another book listed, and there doesn't seem to be. Maybe something that was coming in the UK, but nothing here. So I'm not totally certain what's happening with book two, but that is Winter Counts by David Hesco Wombly Wyden. I remember you really liking that one a couple years ago, and I added it to my TBR, and I still haven't gotten to it, but it sounds great. 
It is great. And so I'm super curious as to what's happening with book two. Yes. The next book for me is Landslide by Susan Conley. Landslide is a quiet yet compelling novel that explores motherhood, marriage, and the ways in which we carry grief. On a remote island off the coast of Maine, Jill is left to care for her teenage sons, who she lovingly refers to as wolves, as her husband recovers from a serious fishing accident. The prose is really sparse, but it's so moving. And this book felt like an encouraging hug from one boy mom to another. I wanted to share this quote from the book um, because it's one that I still think about years later. Conley writes, being a mother isn't anything like I thought it would be. It's harder, better, more confusing, shorter, longer. And I just think that's so true. All of it. It just captures it perfectly. And that debut was Landslide by Susan Conley. I agree completely. That quote does capture it all. I haven't read that one. I remember when it came out, but that definitely captures motherhood in a nutshell. Mm -hmm, It sure does. Okay, my next one is an older title, Eleanor Oliphant is Completely Fine by Gail Honeyman. When the book opens, Eleanor is a loner who goes to work and comes home and rarely interacts with humans outside rare conversations with her office mates. Brought up in the foster care system after a tragic accident when she was 10, Eleanor has never had anyone look out for her or seek her company. When a new IT employee crosses paths with her, Eleanor begins to learn what it is like to make a friend and be a friend to others. The book does begin a little slowly, so do not put it down if you are not drawn in immediately. Eleanor will completely grow on you, and you will not want the book to end. However, while I was sad that the story was finished, the ending was spectacular. I will say that parts of the story were grimmer than I expected them to be, so do be prepared for that. But I very much enjoyed the book and loved its message that the kindness of one person can completely change another person's life. This is a motto to live by. And that was Eleanor Oliphant is Completely Fine by Gail Honeyman. Yes, the story went a totally different direction than I thought initially, and I thought it was wonderful. I agree completely. And it looks like she may have a book coming out in 2024. On Goodreads, it says Untitled by Gail Honeyman (laughs) and with a 2024 release date. So we'll see if somebody just put that in or if that actually means it's coming. Yeah, and that was such a huge book. And so, yeah, you just wonder, like, where have you been, Gail? What have you been doing? Exactly, because I think it came out in, like, 2017. Yeah, yeah, it was, a, it was a while ago. Yeah, for sure. Okay, next for me is Raft of Stars by Andrew J. Graff. This story follows Bread and Fish, and they're two rough-and-tumble boys who spend their summers shooting coyotes and biking through the streets of their sleepy little Wisconsin town in 1994. In an act of loyalty, Fish fires shots at Bread's abusive father. And the boys believe that they have committed a crime, and so they flee into the woods and are left to fend off the harsh wilderness alone as they're chased by a rich cast of characters who desperately wish for their safe return. This is such a timeless story of adventure and friendship, and it read like a modern-day Huckleberry Finn with vivid nature descriptions that reminded me of Peter Heller and William Kent Kruger. Andrew J. Graff's sophomore novel, True North, is coming in January, and I can't wait to read it. That was Raft of Stars by Andrew J. Graff. I never read Raft of Stars, but my husband did, and he really liked it, and I'm really looking forward to True North. Oh, good. I'm glad he liked it. Definitely. So my next book is Black Buck by Mateo Escarapur. 22-year-old Darren was the valedictorian at Bronx Science and has been content to live with his mother and work as a barista at a Starbucks ever since. One day, he impresses the CEO of Samwam, a startup officing in the same building as his Starbucks, and he suddenly finds himself thrown into the crazy, frenetic world of Samwam as its only Black employee. Reinventing himself as Buck after a brutal week of training and indoctrination, Darren becomes a cold-hearted salesman willing to make sales for the company at any cost. When his home life takes a tragic turn, Darren realizes that he must jettison Buck and find his way back to the Darren he once was. Ascarapur targets startup culture, workplace hazing, systemic racism, and more in this unique, quick-witted, often hilarious debut novel that is unlike anything that I have read before. On a side note, his cover story is one of my favorites. It's a very clever cover with the background is yellow and it's a Starbucks-looking cup that a black hand is holding. And I told him how much I loved the cover and he indicated that he didn't like it at all at first. And so pushing back a little bit, the publisher said, let me send you a cover, like a mock-up that you can put around another book and leave it on a shelf. 
and look at it for like a week, walking by it, seeing what you think over time. And that's how they always used to do covers. But now in the digital age, they just email it and you look at it on a fake book on the computer and all that. So they sent him the book. He started walking by it every day and he realized that he actually loved it. So I thought that was such a fun story that they said, no, no, let's stick with it because his cover is one of the most recognizable covers that has come out in the last couple of years. And he also has a new book coming out in 2024. This sounds pretty different from this one, and I'm eagerly awaiting that. And this title is Black Buck by Mateo Escarapur. Interesting. That is one that I haven't read before, but I can picture the cover so vividly from years ago, even though I never picked it up. So you're absolutely right that it is one that just sticks in your mind. Absolutely. Next for me is Shiner by Amy Jo Burns. This is a story of Wren Bird, and she's a young girl growing up in remote Appalachia, where the whiskey is strong and outsiders cannot be trusted. Wren's father is this mystical mountain preacher, and he charms poisonous snakes as his primary form of worship. For a short book, this packs a lot of punch and has a really strong sense of place. I loved the unique structure of the story, It starts out where readers view the same events from various points of view. And so then that shines a new light on the situation as we see it from different characters' perspectives. At its heart, this was a story of female friendship, loyalty, and the silent sacrifices of motherhood. And Amy Jo Burns has a second book coming out. Technically, it's not out yet. It comes out in January 2024. It's called Mercury. But I have read it and I've loved it. So that is definitely one to have on your radar. And that was Shiner by Amy Jo Burns. I was just going to mention Mercury because all of the pre-pub chatter that I have seen so far, people are raving. I can't wait to get to it. It's up very soon for me. I'm doing the same Celadon read along that you're doing where we have groups of five and we chat about the book in parts. So I need to get going on it. I think you're going to love it. I think so too. And now for a quick break to take a moment and thank today's sponsor, Air Doctor. Americans spend an average of 90% of their time indoors and take approximately 20,000 breaths a day. According to the EPA, indoor air is two to five times more polluted than outdoor air, and in some cases, even up to 100 times more polluted. I struggle with allergies myself that poor air quality exacerbates, and so using my air purifier from Air Doctor really helps me manage my allergies. So what's the solution to poor air quality? Air Doctor has introduced an air purifier that has captured the attention of established media outlets such as CNN, Money, and more. Air Doctor filters out 99.99% of dangerous contaminants and allergens, such as pollen, pet dander, dust mite, mold, and even bacteria and viruses, so your lungs don't have to. All Air Doctor purifiers also feature whisper jet fans, 30% quieter than ordinary air purifiers. Want to breathe better? Head to airdoctorpro.com and use promo code Thoughts from a Page, and depending on the model, you'll receive up to 39% off or up to $300 off. Exclusive to podcast customers, you will also receive a free three year warranty on any unit, which is an additional $84 value. Lock in this special offer by going to A-I-R-D-O-C-T-O-R-P-R-O.com and use promo code thoughts from a page. Air Doctor also comes with a 30 day money back guarantee. So if you don't love it, just send it back for a refund minus the shipping. And now back to the rest of the show. So my next one is Valentine by Elizabeth Wetmore. Wetmore's debut novel takes place in 1976, Odessa, Texas a town centered around the oil business and filled with men who have come to work in the oil fields. Following the brutal attack of a teenage girl by an oil field worker, the town struggles to come to terms with the crime, and battle lines are drawn. The story slowly unfolds through the perspectives of numerous women in the town, women who understand that the odds are stacked against them but are willing to stand up for what they believe. Wetmore's lyrical prose and stark descriptions of the dusty landscape and impact of oil discovery on the region create a haunting and ultimately redemptive tale that I could not put down until I reached the last page. And that is Valentine by Elizabeth Wetmore. Okay, I remember that cover too. I think it's like very distinctive with like a purplish kind of sky and really beautiful. It is. It's a stunning cover as well. My last title is I Am Pilgrim by Terry Hayes. I Am Pilgrim is a globetrotting saga that follows a secret agent tasked with saving the United States from an unthinkable terrorist attack. I was so invested in the characters and even had deep empathy for the ones who were making truly horrific decisions. The writing is so gripping and Terry Hayes struck the perfect balance between character development and a fast moving plot. I've never annotated a thriller before. But the writing was incredible, and I loved the observations about human nature. I cannot wait to read his long-awaited second book, The Year of the Locust, which comes out in February. 
I Am Pilgrim came out in 2014. And for almost a decade now, people have been wondering, when is the second book coming? I think there's a big backstory behind that. But um, it is finally coming out in February. It is over a 1000 pages, I think. And I just can't wait to read every word. That was I Am Pilgrim by Terry Hayes. I remember when I worked at Murder by the Book and literally once a week, somebody would come in and say, okay, I need the next Terry Hayes book. And we'd be like, unfortunately, even though it was supposed to be written, it hasn't been. So to have this new book finally coming out a decade after his first book did is monumental. I cannot wait for my copy to arrive so I can start reading it. I think I will drop everything when it arrives. Yes. And what did the publicist tell you? I feel like you've got to mention that. Oh, yes. The publicist said it was the best thriller he had read and he doesn't even know how long and that it's going to change the course of the genre. And I was like, oh, those are big words. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He also talked about how Hayes had had trouble getting the second book down on the page. And it's not a sequel. It's a separate story. But that during COVID, he ended up stranded far away from his family. Like I think his family lives in Australia and he was in Portugal, something like that. And so he ended up with a lot of time to write. And so that is when he got most of it back down on the page or at least got going again with it and then was able to kind of wrap it up. And you're right. It is very long. I laughed when I saw Atria posting on Twitter about the bound manuscript, which is the step before the galley. And because of the way they print, it couldn't even fit in one bound manuscript. So it was two two copies that looked like two different books, but it was all the same book. Yes. And I it's going to be a doorstop of a book. And as soon as it shows up, I am going to drop everything that I am doing and read it. (laughs) It'll take me forever, but I can't wait. (laughs) Hopefully ours will come close in time and we can buddy read. Yes. Yes. So my last one is another book that I have talked a ton about because I just loved it so much. And that is Songs in Ursa Major by Emma Brody. This beautifully written debut tells a fictionalized, loosely based version of the relationship between James Taylor and Joni Mitchell in the late 1960s. It's a coming-of-age tale that follows Jane Quinn, a talented singer, as she rockets to stardom. She encounters extreme sexism in the music industry, battles with wanting to stay true to herself and her music, whether to choose love or a career, the stigma of mental illness, and much more. Brody brings the music of the era to life and had me wishing I could actually listen to Jane's music. Songs in Ursa Major ask the question so many female artists must face. What are they willing to sacrifice for their dreams? I love that the story focused on Jane's unwillingness to conform and how she made a name for herself anyway. It's just such a beautiful book. And that is Songs in Ursa Major by Emma Brody. I adored this one too. It went to some different places I wasn't expecting and felt like a little bit unpredictable. And I got to interview Emma for one of our first chapters and chats conversations after the book came out. And she was saying that the book had been optioned for the screen. But I don't know if it ever got picked up or if it still will in the future. She said at that time she was still kind of waiting to hear back what the plan was. But again, that was years ago. And I'm still like holding out hope because I think that would translate to the screen so well. I agree. And the other cool thing is her brother is the person I think who wrote the lyrics in the book that Jane sings. And I think he put them to music or maybe Emma wrote the lyrics, but he wrote the music and put it to music. So there is actually... After I said this, there is a music out there that comes from the book. I think it was just done later. I think so, too. So that finishes up the debuts that we are chatting about that are already out. Now we're each going to share one debut from 2024 that we're excited about. But if you want more 2024 goodness, you can check out our literary lookbook on sale for $10 and you can purchase it through the shop on Cindy's Patreon. And I'll put the link in the show notes as well. Great. So what's your 2024 debut? It is Northwoods by Amy Pease, and it comes out January 9th. This debut is set in the wake of the opioid epidemic in a backwoods Wisconsin tourist town. And Northwoods follows Officer Eli North. He's an Afghanistan veteran, and he investigates a murder of a local teenage boy and the disappearance of a tourist teenage girl. Amy Pease handles PTSD and addiction so thoughtfully here. My heart just broke for Eli as he desperately was trying to hold on to these broken relationships that he had and his career that was heading south fast. The story has really timely themes and an immersive setting. And again, kind of reminded me of that William Kent Kruger nature-based writing, which I love. And that was Northwoods by Amy Pease. And it is such a solid mystery debut. That's another one we had to arm wrestle for. 
I love that book so much. I read it a while ago and I have been telling everyone I know they need to read it. It's actually a traveling galley for my Patreon group and everybody has been loving it. And my husband read it. What I felt was so outstanding about it and a little bit different than other stories was that she really does explore what addiction is like. And the main character is struggling with addiction. And she really gets in his head and just sort of explains what that pull is like and how it impacts him. It was kind of hard to read at times, but it's so well done. And it was just an outstanding mystery. Mm -hmm, Absolutely. What's your 2024 debut? So I'm going to talk about one and then I'm going to quickly highlight another because there are just so many good books coming up. Okay. So the first one is The Husbands by Holly Gramazio, which comes out in April. When Lauren returns home to her flat in London late one night, she is greeted at the door by her husband, Michael. There's only one problem. She's not married. She's never seen this man before in her life. But according to her friends, her much improved decor and the photos on her phone, they've been together for years. As Lauren tries to puzzle out how she could be married to someone she can't even remember meeting, Michael goes to the attic to change a light bulb and abruptly disappears. In his place, a new man emerges, and a new, slightly altered life reforms around her. Realizing that her attic is creating an infinite supply of husbands, Lauren confronts the idea that if swapping lives is as easy as changing a light bulb, how do you know you've taken the right path? This book is so unique and definitely has an incredibly creative premise. I was dying to see where it went. It was hyped a lot when I went to the booksellers conference in October, Fall Con. This is one of the ones that they were chatting all over the place about. They had had trouble coming up with a cover. They got the cover after I left Fall Con and it has the word husbands kind of interwoven through the ladder. But I just thought, how is this going to work? Like, and after a hundred pages, I'm going to be tired of all these new husbands. But she really takes it in some interesting directions and makes you think a lot about having relationships, who you choose, what that's like. And I just thought it was so, so well done. And that is The Husbands by Holly Gramazio. I can't wait to read that one. It's really just so clever. And then the other one that I quickly want to highlight is The Turtle House by Amanda Churchill. I also love this one. Comes out at the end of February. It's set in Texas. A grandmother who came from Japan in the 19, I think, 50s or so, and a granddaughter who has just dropped out of graduate architecture school end up finding themselves together at home, trying to deal with the things that have gone wrong in their lives and trying to help each other out. So there's a lot going on, but it's so beautifully done. I love the Japanese angle of the story. And it has one of the most beautiful covers I've ever seen. And that is The Turtle House by Amanda Churchill. Yes, another one I cannot wait to read. I just know you're going to love it. Great. Thank you, Kelly, so much for coming on today. I always love chatting books with you. And this was a fun topic. It really had me thinking. Yeah, me too. And it does just give you such an appreciation for authors who are able to put their story that they've had in their head for sometimes years and years and years and finally get it out on the page and into the world. And that's no small feat. And so I just have a soft spot for debut authors and just really continue to seek them out in my reading. I agree. I always say that I like to get in on the ground floor is how I view it, because I did that with Fiona Davis. I read her first book when it came out. I actually did it with Jacqueline Winspear many years ago, CJ Box. I think it's really fun when you read a debut and then you continue to follow that author for years and years. So I love referring to it as getting it on the ground floor because you just feel like you followed them for their entire career. Oh, that's such a good way to put it. I love that. Well, thanks again for coming on. Thanks for having me. History is complicated. The story of human progress is long, messy, and riddled with controversies big and small. On Conflicted, we dive headfirst into history's most infamous events and contentious figures. We try and untangle the good from the bad, the fact from the fiction, and the monsters from the misunderstood. Was Genghis Khan a murderous butcher or a civic pioneer? Did the allied powers go too far in firebombing the German city of Dresden at the twilight of World War II? And how did the Marquis de Sade acquire such a sinister reputation? And was any of it true? These are just a few of the tough questions we wrestle with and investigate on Conflicted. So if you love history or just enjoy a good story, please join me, your host, Zach Cornwell, for a fascinating new topic each and every month. Conflicted, a history podcast, is available on Spotify, Apple, or wherever else you get your podcasts. I hope to see you soon.
Hello, and welcome to Novel Conversations, a podcast about the world's greatest stories. I'm your host, Frank Lavallo, and for each episode of Novel Conversations, I talk to two readers about one book, and together, we summarize the story for you. We introduce you to the characters, we tell you what happens to them, and we read from the book along the way. So if you love hearing a good story, you're in the right place. Our ninth season is coming this fall. Tune in to hear from some of the all-time great authors, Charles Dickens, Jules Verne, F. Scott Fitzgerald, and more. Subscribe to Novel Conversations wherever you listen to podcasts. Thank you so much for listening to my podcast. I would love to connect with you on Instagram or Facebook, where you can find me at Thoughts From a Page. If you enjoy the show, please consider joining my Patreon group to access bonus content and support the podcast. If you have a moment to rate the show or subscribe to it wherever you listen to your podcasts, I would really appreciate it. It makes a big difference. And please tell all of your friends about Thoughts From a Page. Word of mouth does wonders to help the show grow. I hope you'll tune in next time. Women's Running Stories, where we explore the intersection between running and life. Because every woman who is committed to a running journey has a story to tell, and this is where you'll find those stories. I am host and producer Sheree Louise Turner. I'm a 53-year-old runner, and together with original music by musician and runner Cormac O'Regan, we bring these inspirational stories to life. Please join us to fuel your adventures.